Good morning. If you'd like to start, turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28. If you remember last week, we kind of looked at the thought of the church being universal and the church being local. And we have great evidence of that in Scripture, and we definitely see it here today. We see it uh, with our brothers and sisters in Ukraine who we've been praying for, and we have brothers and sisters here local. So we do know the church is worldwide, and uh, with the church being worldwide, there can be some difficult things with that. One, you have different congregations will have uh, you know, different men in authority. We do not have a group of men that is over the state and all the churches of Christ within the state. That's not how we operate it. Each congregation, if, if it does have, it will have an elder and have deacons, and it will have the members. Uh, some congregations do not have that. But, you know, an eldership, as in here, if we had one here, does not reign over Northside or, or Bellefonte you can get into pretty good trouble doing it like that. So last week, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at how far is the church? Where is it at? It is universal. And this morning, I wanted to look at something that is very crucial in relation to the church, our relation to the church, and the world's relation to the church. And that really is found most obvious here in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew, the 28th chapter. We look at this as the great commission that Christ gave his apostles. And let's start here in verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We know this very well. We all all know this section here but to make sure we understand that christ has all authority is crucial verse 19 it says go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father son and the holy spirit and he goes on to to say teaching them to observe all things that i commanded you and lo i'm with you always even to the end of the age and the reason he could give this commission is because he now has all power and all authority. And so what is crucial about this is, is you get to the New Testament, and there is no words of Christ. There is no Christ coming down to the congregations and teaching them how to behave as the church. Uh, There is not Christ coming down and teaching the elders how to be elders, the deacons how to be deacons, evangelists how to be evangelists. We have the apostles. We have the apostles going around from town to town, teaching them how to be who they're supposed to be. But a lot of people will put the apostles' teachings on a lower level than Christ. And I think that can run into some issues. And the main issue being is, well, the apostles said that, not Jesus. That's a big deal. It's a big deal to people who may make that difference, and it can be crucial to the way you look at Scripture, because if it's not the words of Christ, you know, the words of Christ is very limited within Scripture. It's just but really a speck of all the Scripture that's there. But we do look at the entirety of the Word as the Word of God. But some people will look at this as, well, the apostles said that. It must be tradition. Or it must just be what they think is best for the church, not what is basically the law of the church or the standard of the church. And so this morning, for those who are already on that side, I want to just remind you of this fact but those who may be struggling with well this is the words of Paul and not Christ how much do I need to pay attention to it some people struggle with that and I want to encourage you that the words of Paul are on the same level as the words of Christ and so where I want to start out this morning is in John chapter 17 John the 17th chapter I hope this lesson as I do every lesson will bring encouragement to to someone some may not feel like it's encouraging but Deep down, that's where my motives are. John 17 and 
I want to read some motivating words from Christ dealing with us today. And it's amazing to know, it's an amazing feeling to know that Christ prayed for future believers. So in John 17 and verse 20, it reads, I do not pray for these alone, and these in context would be his disciples, his apostles. He doesn't pray for these alone. He says, but also for those who will believe in me through what? Through their word. So when we get to the book of Acts, we get to the Corinthians and the Romans and, and all those books, Jesus is praying to his Father that we today, we then, <laughs> would believe through the words of the apostles. So that must mean the apostles' words are crucial. It must mean that they're applicable for salvation. And it says that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. So he's hinging this all, us being one with him, just like Christ is one with the Father. This is all hinged on our belief of the words that come from the apostles. You know, I, I've always just looked at this. I need to make sure I believe the words of Christ. But the apostles also had a word and we'll learn later, and most of us know where that word originated from, but still yet, he's praying that through the words of the apostles that we may be able to have a relationship with Christ. So the words of the apostles, you're going to hear this phrase a lot this morning, is very crucial. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So we have this prayer, prayer for Unity between Christ and his people. And we also get to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. And we see the apostles trying to relay the same message of unity dealing with the word. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we are going to read verse 10. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. It says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ... And for those who may not know, but typically when you're reading the phrase in the name of, it typically means by the authority of, in the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul did have the authority to make the statement he's about to make, that, all, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So we read over in John where Jesus is desiring unity between between uh, man and him, that we would be one with Christ, just as Christ is one with the Father. Now, how is Christ one with the Father? Do they speak the same thing? Same doctrine? Yes, they do. Did Jesus come down and maybe have a different way of teaching it? Yeah, but it's still the same doctrine. That's what's crucial. I do not believe that this morning we all should be as robots, and when we leave here, we all are beeping the same way <laughs> we should be able to teach the gospel in the way that it's impacted us but if someone was to evaluate all the ways that we're teaching and they looked at every message we taught it, it will all be the same truth you know truth is truth no matter what so you may have a way to present christ to someone that has impacted you that may not have impacted me so but when we're teaching, when we're speaking, we're still speaking the same word. We're still speaking the same truth. You know, and I find great confidence that when, when we depart here, there's not really a worry that goes by that I'm worrying about someone teaching a false doctrine. I'm not really concerned about it at all. But there are places where that's happening. Where they depart, they go out and teach the truth they want to teach and not the truth that's within Scripture. Okay. So the apostles were carrying out this unity that Christ had in mind for the church. Now, if you'd like to start turning to Ephesians chapter 1. We read this last week, and I want to put it in our memory for this lesson. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read just a couple verses here in chapter 1, then we'll be turning to chapter 5. Ephesians, the first chapter. We mentioned a couple weeks ago, about three weeks ago, about Christ and his position in the church, that Christ is head over the church, that he is the one who has the right 
to be the authority figure. So he has the ability to set the standard of the church. If he wanted it to be a certain way, guess what he would have done? He would have made it a certain way. But we know the way that he has. So Ephesians chapter 1, just as a reminder, verse 22 and verse 23, And he, the Father, put all things under his, Christ, his feet, and gave him, this is Christ, to be head over all things to the church. So all things in relation to the church. That's the standard of the church. That's the way of uh, worship. That's who is allowed to teach who's allowed to preach, who's supposed to evangelize, who's supposed to be all these. He has set the standard because he is head over all things the church, which is, verse 23, his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So Christ, as a reminder, I know that you're probably thinking, Evan, I know this, but guess what? Like I tell you every time we have this conversation, there's some people that don't know this, that Christ is the only one that has the ability to set the standard for the church. Now turn to chapter 5 and look at verse 23 and verse 24. Okay. So this is our relationship to Christ being the head. This is our relation to him here. Verse 23 and verse 24, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head over the church. That means he's head over us. And it says he is the savior of the body. So that means he's the savior of the church because the church is the body. So if you're in the church, you're part of a system that saves. Verse 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, which is us, we are to be subject to Christ because he is the head. He is the one who has that authority in the church. John chapter 13 and verse 20. Okay, so this is where we get into, this was pretty what I say early on. The apostles didn't really get it. Uh, that message is pretty clear. Uh, it's hard for me to, to say that the apostles really understood the value of what was going on. We know that before the cross, there was some disbelief. There was little faith. They, didn't, they weren't fully committed. But we see after the cross a whole different story of the apostles. They were committed. And we've seen that every one of them, besides Judas, stuck it out. And they were faithful. As long as we know, they were faithful until they died. But before the cross, not all things came to pass. And so, yes, miracles were being done. Yes, Jesus was walking on water. Enough for me to say I would believe. But how could I say that? Because I've never witnessed it. But these men were being prepped for the world to listen to. There was so much pressure, and that may have been what got to them. I don't know. Something got to the apostles. Something got to the disciples besides a select few. And it may be the pressure. John 13 and verse 20. John 13 and verse 20. And it says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. That's a lot of pressure. Because the, the apostles are going to go out, and they're the ones that were sent by whom? They were sent by Christ. And it says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whoever I send receives me. So that means that if you deny the ones that he has sent, you are denying Christ. And it says, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. So, how important is it that people understand that when they're reading in the Corinthians and they're reading in all these epistles and they're not in typed in red, that they make sure that they treat it the same as if they're reading the words of Christ. Because if you reject them, who are you rejecting? Christ. And not only Christ, you would be rejecting who sent Christ. And that's God, the Father. So, the next time <laughs> you're in that conversation, uh, because it's, it's, it's easy to get to it, because in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul writes, I say, but not the Lord. So, could someone stand up and preach, well, Paul's just saying that. Jesus didn't say, Paul's saying that. Did Jesus preach every topic that man needed to know? Did he preach and teach every single one of them? No. Could he have? Absolutely he could have, but he didn't. 
You can go in the New Testament and find where Paul says, I say, not the Lord. And that's something that we don't have a written record of. Now, he may have because the end of John says that he taught so much that if you were to write it down in books, the world couldn't contain it. So he may have dealt with every issue. But what we know of is what we have. And so when Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 7, I say and not the Lord, we can't disregard that as just some human thought. As someone who says, I think I got a good thought that could help out the church. That's not the origins of the teachings of the apostles. Now, before we get to that origin, turn real quick to Colossians, or sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this may not seem very important or crucial to you, but I've had several conversations where this has come up about the apostles. And I actually get offended. It kind of makes, makes me mad because these men dedicated more than we could ever dedicate to the cause of Christ. There was, so, there was much more determination from these men during the time frame they lived in in comparison to us. It is so easy for us to teach the gospel now. We can reach so many people by staying at home. They couldn't do that. They, if they stayed home, they'd reach nobody. They had to get out and face people face to face. They had to feel rejection face to face, not over the internet, not over the phone. Face to face, they had to be told, well, we don't believe in this. You're part of some crazy cult that drinks blood and eats flesh. They had to hear that face to face. Their determination went such well, their determination really was fulfilled because it says they taught everybody. Colossians, the first chapter. So at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's look here at verse 20. Uh, Paul is writing, So then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So a lot of people just focus on the ambassador Oh, we're ambassadors for Christ, and we know what it means to be an ambassador. It means to be a representative, uh, the one who you're representing. And so the apostles were representing Christ. And a lot of people, when they're teaching and preaching, they say, oh, we're ambassadors of Christ, and that's about it with the verse. But pay attention to it. It says, as though God were pleading through us. So now there is a time in history where God is pleading through man, and that man is not just Christ. And it says, because of this pleading, we implore you on behalf of Christ, so that's the ambassador part, on, on that behalf, be reconciled to God. So they are acting in direct command from God, and they have authority. They are telling them to be reconciled back to God. Not an opinion, not an option, they are telling them as one that has authority. Now, two more of the origin. Put your finger real quick on John 14. And as we're going to John, I want to stop at Acts, the second chapter. So we're going to go to John, but while we're flipping back, let's flip to Acts chapter 2. I know that the apostles had authority. I know that man looked at them as people who needed to be submitted to. Now, they weren't kings and nothing like that, but their word was to be something to be uh, submissive to. And we know this because of Acts chapter 2. When, when about 3,000 souls were saved, it says they were um, continually steadfast in whose doctrine? Think about that. The Apostles' Doctrine. Now, that's why I want to stop here before we get to John uh, 14. So Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Let's put this in our memory here. And uh, we we'll start here, verse 40. In many other words, he was testified and exhorting, saying, Be saved from this perverse, perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly, in the apostles' doctrine. 
So that's crucial to know, but we have to know and be able to teach people the origin of the apostles' doctrine. Because it does not originate from the twelve sitting around a table and saying, okay, we need to get a we need to get a doctrine set. We need to get it rolling because uh, Pentecost is coming and they need something to believe. Okay, so Paul, you're going to be in charge of the Gentiles. Peter, you're going to be in charge of the Jews. Uh, uh, whoever else, bring the drinks. <laughs> That's not how it was. They weren't sitting around like, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What's the doctrine going to be? Uh, uh, how do we know they're going to believe us? So we know, most of us know the origin of the apostles' doctrine. It goes back to Jesus really picking those men out. But then we get to texts like John chapter 14. We'll start here in John 14, verse 26. And it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. This is uh, crucial. Underline it. All things means what? All things. I, I, I never liked when someone says all doesn't mean all. Then what does all mean? <laughs> far as I'm concerned, all means all. When it says God created all things, what he made? He made all things. Now, are there some things that have evolved throughout the years? Absolutely. I think human beings have evolved from when Adam and Eve were first created. I think there is some form of evolution, no doubt. Things change with the environment they're in. That's a natural thing. But God made all things. All things. And when it says that uh, uh, Christ bore all sin, how much sin did he bear? All sin. There wasn't a, a little white lie that was left out. He bore it all. And when he is telling them that I'm going to send someone, my father is going to send someone, and when he gets to you, you are going to know all truth. I don't know of any man or woman up to the point of Acts chapter 2 that knew all truth besides Christ. I don't know of one. I don't think Moses knew all truth. I think he was led and guided and taught, but as far as I'm concerned, he didn't know all truth, as far as I know. Now, if I'm wrong, you can correct me. So, turn to John chapter 16 real quick. We'll read a couple verses here, verses 22 and verse 20, sorry, 12 and verse 13 of John 16. John 16, 12 and verse 13. And it reads, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you the things the things to come. Okay, so this is something for us to say easily that when we get to the apostles' teaching, they know all truth. It should be easy for us to make that assessment. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10 real quick. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10. First Corinthians 2 and verse 10, it says, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. I have this referenced by John 14 and John 16. Because some people may wonder, well, where do the apostles get their information from? Who? Okay, they get it from the Spirit, but where does the Spirit get his information from? John 16 is clear. It says that he will not speak on his own authority. Now here's some more to bring it into light about who's guiding the apostles. It says, for the Spirit searches all things. I like that, all things. It goes right back to John 14, goes right back to John 16. It will search all things, yes, the deep things of God. So the one that's guiding the apostles to establish the church is searching all the deep things that God has to give back to the apostles now look at acts chapter 20 and verse 27 we have paul here talking to the elders i believe 
if I'm in the right section. Uh, Acts, the 20th chapter and verse 27. I want to say that he is in Ephesus at this moment, talking to the elders there. In verse 27, he says, I have not shunned to declare to you what? The whole counsel of God. The reason he could do that is because he is being guided and led by the Spirit who knows what? All things. So when he was talking to the elders, guess, guess what the elders now know? <laughs> the whole counsel of God. They know it all. He says, I didn't shun to declare to you everything. Paul didn't leave out nothing. So now the elders would go back to Ephesus and they knew how to spiritually lead because now they know what? The whole counsel of God. So they wouldn't need as many visits from Paul or Peter or whoever else. They know it. He gave it to them. They wrote it down. Maybe. They had photographic memory. I don't know. But Paul told them, I did not shun. I did not hide myself to give you all of it. And that's important for elders to know is the truth and to know it very well. You want someone that will lead you that knows how to lead and what to teach, how to guide. You know, it's different from just a member of the church. Elders are definitely held to a higher respect and Paul gave them all. And why? Why do you think he'd done this? Look at the next verse. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, uh, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves, wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Doesn't that make sense to say, hey, you, you got a flock. Uh, there's definitely going to be wolves coming in. Do you want to know how to protect them? Wouldn't that be great for the shepherds, for the one that's leading and guiding to know? Paul gave them all understanding of what the church needed to know. He did not hold back. Second Peter. And the reason I'm not this morning so focused on Christ is because majority of people, when you get to this point, a lot, there's a lot of people that believe in Christ, whether they, whether they really want to publicly acknowledge it or not. There's a lot of people that believe in Jesus throughout the world. And there's a lot of people that believe that Jesus has authority. But the issue is, is a lot of people will put themselves in an equal playing field. As in, I can set my own standard. I can set my own rules. I'm going to use the words of Christ as just a moral guide but I'm going to choose how to live. A lot of people live that way. Really what they do is they put themselves in the position of a God. And that's why I say that there's not a human being that doesn't believe in God because the people that do not believe in God, when you actually look at the way they live, they put themselves as their own God, their own figure of authority, their own standard. That's what God is. And they won't accept that, but it's true. Okay. Second Peter, and, and, and this is what's neat here about Second Peter. I just want to read some verses real quick out of Peter. Second Peter chapter 1, we'll start here in verse 12. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. For this reason, I will not be uh, negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth... Yes, I think it is right as long as I am in this tent to stir up, stir you up by reminding you. Knowing that shortly I put off my tent just as the Lord Jesus Christ has shown me. It says, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So what does Peter know? I'm going to die. And what do I need to do for the congregation? I need to leave them a reminder. Now, his reminder was probably in a written form, and we probably uh, don't have the reminder because we don't have a third Peter or fourth Peter, but I'd say he wrote it down for them. And he is letting them know it is my duty that I remind you of the truth, and the words here are the present truth that you have. Now, continue in 2 Peter, but go to chapter 3. Chapter 3. 
the first two verses. Beloved, I, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir you or stir up your minds by way of reminder. This is, <laughs> if you want to know the theme of Second Peter, here it is. He's re- just letting them know you're going to be reminded. You're going to be reminded. I'm doing these things so you can be reminded. And so he's writing this epistle so that they may be reminded that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us. You notice that? The commandments, not of Christ, not of the Spirit, not of the Father, the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So either Peter has a big ego about what he teaches, or he is in line with truth. When Peter was teaching, it was not suggestions. It was not something, I think you guys need to do this. I think this will help you. Peter and the apostles, they knew these things were crucial for their salvation. And here's how crucial they know it. If you think that this may be an ego from Peter, let's turn back to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I say if Peter may be looked at as one that a little proud of his teaching, then Paul is a little bit more. 1 Corinthians 14, and we'll look here at verse 37. And then we will continue on one more thought after this. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. And it reads, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. The things that he writes, and Paul wrote a lot, a lot of instructions, a lot of warnings, a lot of heeding, Um, a lot of encouragement to the churches. He's saying, the things that I'm writing are the commandments of the Lord. And the Peter, uh, same way, from our Lord and Savior. And so, when you do come across uh, verses like, let me, it's off the cuff here, I think I'm in the right spot. Uh, Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You come across stuff like this, and I don't know if, (laughs) I don't know what it is, but I've just been in several situations where I've heard the phrase, oh, that's the words of the apostles. That's the words of the disciples. I said, why do we even have it if it's something you're going to blow out of the water anyway? And here's one of the arguments I've had before, and it's in this section here. Start in verse 1. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. So you put yourself in the opposite shoes. Put yourself in someone that looks at the apostles and they look at them more as suggestions and just little guidelines here and there. Not as the commandments like Christ. Put yourself in that position real quick and, and, and read. And, 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 and read the text and see why you would even waste your time with it. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Well, we would have to listen to that because it's just the words of the apostle. Now I praise you, brethren, that you, re- that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So this has always been a hiccup for people. Okay, so Paul uses the word tradition. Now what is tradition? A tradition is a handing down of teachings, correct? Okay, so I think about where is Paul's handing down of teachings from? Himself? His mom, his dad, his aunt, his uncle? No, because Paul never dealt with stuff like that. There's not one time you'll read where Paul said, my mom or my dad taught me this, I'm teaching you this. There is a time where Paul acknowledged the passing down of teachings from somebody else with Timothy, his mother, and his grandmother. But with Paul, look at his teaching. Where's the origin of his teaching? Christ, the Spirit, And we just read that when he writes something, what is it? It is the commandment of God, 1 Corinthians 14. So he says, keep the traditions that the handing down of teachings, which was handed down from God to him, from him to the church at Corinth, just as I delivered them uh, to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. And he, he goes on. So 
When we're dealing with teachings of the apostles, I hope that when you're reading, you're not thinking, well, this is just some man. This is just another person writing about this. He's not as important as the words in red. Well, Paul and Peter both declared that their words were direct commandments of God. Paul said, Lord, and Peter said, Lord, our Savior. Now, lastly, the great thing about the word, I don't know why I'm holding this pen. Someone needs to break me of that habit. Second Timothy, I want you to, to really focus in on something you've heard probably a million times. So I want you to hear it for the millionth and one time from me so I know that you've heard it. Second Timothy. Okay, so we, we're going to sum it up this morning. The words in red are very important. The words that Rick is teaching you in the Old Testament, very important. <laughs> the words that we have been reading throughout the epistles, very important. And you know that if we are missing a single one, we couldn't understand it all. That's how tight-knit the scripture is. You know, if we didn't know who Moses was, we'd be missing out a lot of information in the New Testament. If we didn't know who the prophets were, if we didn't know who Paul was, we didn't know who these people, it's crucial we understand that we have what we have in our hands. And I remember doing a class, and I am very confident that while I'm holding this and teaching you this, I'm confident that this word will save you. Not, uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because it's been translated over years and years, you get different translations, but I am confident that what I hold today in my hands will be the standard to get you to heaven. So when I'm reading this statement here, I have all confidence in reading it. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16, all scripture. So I like this word all. I love this word all. All scripture. Now, to, to kind of get your mind running, not every word that was penned was inspired. This is weird to think about. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And I remember hearing this for the first time. Because Satan is not inspired by God. God is not dwelling within Satan and saying, you need to do this, this, and this, as far as, as, far as I know. But do we not have words of Satan within the scriptures? Absolutely. But the scripture itself is inspired by God. And, it, and, and what it can do for you is very crucial. It will change the way you live. And this, these two verses here is really enough to get that point across. So it's, it's profitable for doctrine, which we hold very tightly. For reproof, it's definitely a correction in our lives. And instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And the reason I want to end with this text is because you may be uh, someone who has like an evening prayer time. And you may be one who prays, what do I need to do? What, what, where is my place in the church? Where is my place in the world? How can I please you? That may be a prayer you have every day. Well, don't just be don't just be fully comfortable with the words of Christ. We have to be comfortable with the words of the apostles because they too are direct commands from God. And so this morning, as we think about the early church, we think about the apostles and all the things that they went through to sacrifice so that we may have what we have in the form that we have it in. I mean, we are living in such a, what we may think a terrible time, we're living in a wonderful time. Look at the, look at the good side of it. We are here freely. Uh, we are not segregated by color or race. We all can openly worship God at any moment and any time. I do not fear my life standing up here preaching the gospel or anywhere else. Now, everything else may be bad. You may think the world's coming to an end, but this right here is the best thing you can even focus on. 
the spiritual things. And that's all I want you to focus on this morning is how good we actually have it in the kingdom in 2022. And so Brother Dale is going to lead a song, and I want you to take time, obviously, to reflect on yourself. And as always, I would love to encourage you to uh, any sins that you may know that you have to repent of them, whether you want to confide in me or confide in somebody else or confide in God. However you would like to deal with it, just please be honest with yourself and know that, yes, trespasses happen, but being in Christ, they can be dismissed. And if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to believe in the gospel, to repent of your sins and confess the name of Christ and be immersed so that you may be raised up to walk in a newness of life. So anything I can do, I'll be standing up here and Brother Dale's going to lead a song to encourage you. So come now as together we stand and we sing.